Hello and welcome to TV on TV. I'm State Representative Tommy Vitolo. You're watching Brookline Interactive Group. Today is Thursday, March 10th, and we have a great show for you. We've got for an interview today, the fifth in a five part series interviews with candidates for Lieutenant Governor on the Democratic side of the aisle. And that is with Salem Mayor Kim Driscoll filmed a few days ago. But before we get there, the news, uh, United States President Joe Biden has banned the importation of Russian oil into the United States, striking another blow at the Russian economy and causing the price of gasoline in the United States to skyrocket. The United States has also rejected Poland's proposal to send fighter jets to the Ukrainian military over concerns about NATO's involvement in the conflict. The House committee charged with investigating the January 6th Capitol attack is now arguing before a federal judge that former President Donald Trump deserves criminal charges for attempts to commit election fraud. More than 100 years after it sank, scientists have found the remains of the Endurance, the ship that Ernest Shackleton used in his attempt to cross the Antarctic for the first time. The Massachusetts House of Representatives voted yesterday on a supplemental budget that provides additional funding for COVID-19 testing, treatment, vaccines, and PPE. The bill also extends outdoor dining and to-go cocktails until April 1, 2023, provides funding for road repair, supports the resettlement of Ukrainian refugees, and extends COVID-19 anti-eviction protections. The bill now moves on to the Senate. The city of Boston has lifted its indoor vaccine and mask mandate as cases hit recent lows. Brookline is set to follow suit in just a few days on March 12th. Brookline held its Democratic caucus this past Saturday. All 55 delegates elected to the Democratic State Convention have pledged their convention vote to gubernatorial candidate Maura Healy. Brookline's Jack Crane ice rink closed for the season, citing warm weather, and lack of proper refrigeration systems. That's all the news that's fit to speak. And uh, I'm really excited to turn it over to uh, an interview from just a few days ago with Salem mayor and candidate for Lieutenant Governor, Kim Jerskull. So stay tuned and we'll see you on the flip side. And folks, we have a great guest today. We actually have the final, we think, candidate for lieutenant governor in the series, uh, and it's Mayor Kim Driscoll from Salem. Uh, Mayor, thanks for coming on Brookline Interactive Group. Happy to be here. It's a pleasure. And uh, we're going to dive right in because we've only got about 25 minutes. Okay. First question is mostly the same. I ask everybody, what have you been doing your whole life? What's going on? <laughs> Tell us about yourself. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, all of us, I guess, giving us a chance to share a little bit more about who we are. So um, I'm fortunate to be the mayor of Salem, as you know, but what you may not know is I'm actually not a native of Massachusetts. My dad uh, grew up in Lynn, and he was a chef in the Navy, career Navy man. He met my mom, who was from Trinidad, native of Trinidad, uh, when he was in service. And I'm a Navy brat. So I was born in Hawaii, lived on both coasts, um, we always had family in Lynn and family in Westford, so we would be back in Massachusetts frequently. And I came back uh, to go to college in Salem, uh, fell in love with the city, fell in love with my husband, feel fortunate to you know, raise our kids here in a city that's welcoming and inclusive. And I wouldn't live anyplace else. Like uh, Salem is a place that just wraps its arms around you and makes you feel like you lived here your whole life. And uh, I really appreciate that. I think Massachusetts can do that too. So um, Feel fortunate to, to live here, to have worked in Salem, to work in Chelsea when they came out of receivership. I'm definitely a person who um, has had a lot of experiences growing up. Having a, a mom from the West Indies, a dad uh, from the United States meant we had celebrated in lots of different ways uh, and wouldn't trade it for anything else. So that's a great pivot, right? You, you love Salem. You're the mayor of Salem. Uh, Salem is, is wonderful and, and getting better all the time. And now you're saying like, well, but now I want to be lieutenant governor, right? So tell us about um, how you're how you've thought through that and and that decision. 
Yeah, it definitely wasn't easy. I want to say, like, I'm a real student of municipal government. I mentioned I worked in Chelsea when they came out of receivership, felt really proud to be part of a strong team at City Hall who re-engaged residents, who brought renewed investment and um, a professional government uh, to the city of Chelsea. Uh, prior to that, I worked, I did work in Salem right out of college as a planner. I worked in Beverly as their community development director. I really feel like uh, the action is at the local level. The innovation is happening locally. We're seeing that uh, when you think about COVID response and recovery, the, the things you rely on most out of government, educating your kids, keeping your neighborhood safe, investing in those places where you make memories, whether it's a favorite beach or park or a city square, like that all happens locally. I would say to you, uh, this is my fifth term in office. And the reason I'm excited about this Lieutenant Governor's race is because that know-how, that experience at the local level, being able to translate that to work with a strong governor, to not just be a partner to cities and towns, but a real strategic ally is what I hope to do. And what I found, at least in my career locally, is that you can't fully reach your potential as a city without having that partnership from the state. And frankly, the Commonwealth, we don't reach our full potential unless cities and towns are working on all cylinders, particularly our largest you know, regional centers. Um, so I'm really excited about like taking this know-how and this experience on how cities work, what their challenges are. That's the language I speak. It's one that I love. And partnering with a strong governor to say, let's use these federal resources we're going to have. Let's take, seize this moment in time when I think so many people are feeling the sense of urgency, whether it's trying to meet our housing needs, tackling climate change, addressing long overdue questions around race equity. That's the work that mayors do every single day. Um, I feel empowered to, to hopefully be a strong ally to city leaders as Lieutenant Governor to help amplify and empower the work at the local level. And we don't solve any of those problems. We don't take on these challenges without action at the local level. So that nexus between state and city can be powerful and I hope to play a role in that. Now, this question is a little bit self-indulgent, but I, it's my show, so I get to do that once in a while. Um, my, my viewers, many of them know I spent about 10 years working to um, retire coal-fired power plants, often against the wishes, always against the wishes of their owners. Um, and so you and I have something in common in that you also helped to retire a coal-fired power plant uh, in, your, in your city of Salem. Tell us about that. And um, I, I kind of know a little bit of the punchline. Tell us about why uh, the outcome in Salem was novel and important relative to other uh, transitions in other places in the country. Yeah, it's really an interesting story and probably one we don't, we could spend the whole show talking about the coal-fired power plant in Salem, but we won't. Um, I feel like um, it's really interesting. So Salem was one of the filthy five, home to one of the filthy five plants, large coal plants um, that was created in 1950 here and heralded when it came here, right? Lots of jobs, lots of tax revenue, I always find it interesting that it didn't end up on Marblehead Neck or on the Gold Coast in Beverly or Manchester by the sea, right? It focused in in Salem. It's next to a storage plant that serves the regional storage district. You know, there's definitely an environmental justice component to where a lot of these plants were located, Somerset, New Bedford, Fall River, like places that, you know, certainly needed power, we, as we all do, but also ended up in places where folks were, were grateful to have the jobs. Um, fast forward to a time frame when we know fully a lot more now the emissions and what it meant to the communities, and that power plant was never going to survive. When I took office, I had like two um, two people on my shoulder. One person saying in the energy industry, "We need the power. That plant can never close. We are in this New England market needs the energy," and the environmentalist on the other shoulder saying, um, "That plant has to close. It'll never meet our emission standards." And it turns out both were right. The plant needed to close for a whole host of reasons, but we also needed the power. So um, we worked in partnership with the then owner, Dominion, who announced they were closing the plant. We were in the middle of a sort of feasibility analysis. And then two individual, you know, I would say, um, you know, entrepreneurs who said, we think we can build a new gas fired power plant there that would be cleaner and more efficient and make that a bridge to the future till we know we need renewables, we know we need clean energy, but we're not there yet and we still need the power. Um, so that plant was actually closed and transitioned to, at the time it was constructed, it still may be the cleanest, most efficient, quick start natural gas plant in the country um, with a hard stop of 2050. And the goal was, again, it would be the bridge to renewable and the story is going to end, I hope, in a way that allows that to happen as the site directly adjacent to the gas plant has been uh, named, uh, we're working in partnership with offshore wind providers 
uh, to put a, an offshore wind marshalling and construction facility there. So we're right off the federal channel, natural deep water port adjacent to the grid uh, where the power plant will have a hard stop of 2050. Uh, in the meantime, adjacent to it, hopefully we'll be setting up the clean energy sector using this particular port as a, uh, a key you know, in meeting our clean energy goals. You said it twice, but I'm going to say it again because it really is incredible. Um, everyone agreed that, and it's legally binding contract, that the gas plant would be built, but it cannot be a permanent solution. Typically, when a power plant is built, it has a 30-year lifetime, but no required retirement date, and they tend to live 60, 80 years. This plant will ratchet down its, its production over time and will not be allowed to operate as a gas plant after 2050. It's really a remarkable story of um, not allowing the need for a transition to be sort of a blank check to continue uh, down similar problems that we've had in the past. And, it, you know, it, uh, as someone who worked in the energy industry, um, it was it was like for everybody uh, in the industry, this is what a creative way to actually get, nobody believed that anybody would actually sign that contract. We heard about the idea, like, yeah, they're not going to sign that. And they did. Uh, and it's well, really it remarkable. It took a strong collaboration. I remember being on the phone, like literally all weekend with both Governor Patrick, Secretary of EOA at the time, um, Rick Sullivan, you know, the, the owners of the site, Footprint Power, two really enterprising energy guys um, working with Conservation Law Foundation. How do we make this comply with the Global Warming Solutions Act, understand we have a power need now, understand we have a community who's relying on this site for tax revenues. At one point that plant paid the city $9 million in taxes. Through deregulation, that number went down to four and a half million dollars, but still our largest taxpayer, far and away. And also recognize that, you know, the emissions uh, guidelines and regulations that we had need to be met. And so it was creative. It took a tremendous amount of hard work um, and partnership with the state for this transition to happen. And um, it does show you the power of local, state, public, private sectors like coming together to solve problems in a really meaningful way. So thank you for indulging me. Uh, now we got to get back to the, the business at hand. Um, look, you're, you've been a mayor for, you're on your fifth term. Uh, you're bringing, you're clearly bringing that to the race for Lieutenant Governor. Um, tell us a little more about um, city challenges and and challenges really you know specific at this at the city level or the, the large municipal level uh, where you're in the trenches and and what that means uh, for the state four years in the next four years yeah I always say mayors are part of the get stuff done wing of government right the GSD wing there's no hiding in a job like mine people want problems solved every single day. And, and frankly, it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat or if you voted for the person or not, it's still the same challenge and they want it addressed. And I think that experience is unique and helpful when you think about uh, trying to serve as an executive at the state level. Um, many cities, myself, ours included, Salem included, are working on challenges that the same challenges the state has. Uh, for us, key here, you know, there's many, but I would say key are housing. We're part of Greater Boston. We've seen housing prices just shoot up in, you know, incredibly higher than the ability of people who live here to afford a house, whether it's for rent or for ownership. Um, we know that housing is key to the social determinants of health. Right now, Salem has 159 homeless students in our schools. Think about the housing insecurity, the ability to meet your educational outcomes that you hope for, food insecurity, public health. Um, you know, we stood up a regional quarantine site during COVID for our homeless population, um, knowing that, uh, you know, we needed a place for folks in our community to be able to stay and have a stable roof over their environment in a time when we're in the middle of a pandemic. These are challenges that I think mayors have taken on at the local level, but they're key to the future of our Commonwealth. I have, um, I have a 24 year old, our oldest is 24. You know, her job is in Waltham, they're working from home and she's in Atlanta right now. Um, she's there uh, in a house right in Midtown in a unit, I should say an apartment that's less expensive than you could find in Massachusetts with climate that's better. And um, I think our, the competitiveness of our Commonwealth is at stake. 24 year olds wanna be able to live in a community and that's affordable to them. And there's lots of places outside of Massachusetts, particularly when you can work anywhere that we're gonna be up against if we don't figure out how to address housing. Statewide, there's a housing shortage of over 200,000 units. We know the gap between people living longer and, uh, and no place uh, do we know that more than here in Salem. 
We're, we're a community that relies on tourism and hospitality, the service sector. We want the people who pour coffee for a living, who take care of our kids in our childcare centers or our paraprofessionals in our schools, or we want them to be able to live in our community. And right now that is becoming very um, an impossible task. And it wasn't that way just, you know, I'd say three or four years ago, we've seen, you know, the incredible uh, challenge with not enough housing to meet demand, driving prices up. And we have folks coming, frankly, from the, Swamp, the Somervilles, the Brooklines, the JP, the Cambridge, coming to Salem to buy properties because it's more affordable. And uh, we, we welcome people from everywhere, but we need to address this housing challenge if we're serious about not only keeping Massachusetts competitive, but serving the community needs. I want the people who grew up here to be able to live here, like my daughter and others. I want folks who want to age in place here to be able to stay in our community. Um, in my mind, you know, we need some strategies from uh, embracing more housing, looking, we've, we've adopted an ADU policy as of right, or every unit will be affordable. It took us three times, thank you to, thanks to Housing Choice, we're able to get it done, um, but we need more of those opportunities. I'm curious to see what happens with the, the mandate requiring multifamily zoning near public transportation, I think another plus, um, but as communities, many neighborhoods that existed and were built before zoning, you couldn't build now. Uh, because of some of the, frankly, archaic zoning that exists. And so we, we need to find a way forward to address our housing shortages if we're serious about remaining competitive, keeping our young people here, ensuring that the, the people who work in our community that we need in these positions, you know, have a roof over their head. Um, an, another strategy we're looking at is leveraging public land. We have a large high school campus. Can we put housing there that could serve individuals who work in our, in our schools, from custodians and paraprofessionals to educators and others who right now really struggle uh, to afford a place to live. Um, and we need to put lots of open hoods behind that at the state level if we're serious about uh, meeting our housing demands. And that's just one challenge. You know, we could add clim the climate crisis, uh, which as a coastal community, we, we, we experience regularly. Uh, we know there, that's something that is, it, we're not gonna outrun. Um, as we think about uh, housing, we also can't take about, talk about transportation. Most people push back on housing, as you may know, because of the congestion and the transportation. In Salem, we've worked hard to really look at how do we get people around? We're only eight square miles. There's gotta be uh, more ways than just single occupancy vehicles. We're super proud to have Salem Skipper. It's a city subsidized rideshare service. It works on like an Uber platform, uh, but it's a, a van service that picks you up right at the corner. Uh, you can hail it, it's available within 15 minutes. It's a buck or two, depending upon your age. Uh, to ride it. And um, it's served over 40,000 rides since it started, half of that through the pandemic when we weren't even at full occupancy. So there are solutions. How do we amplify them? How do we empower them? How do we use some of the resources that we're going to have coming out of this pandemic to, where we're not going to go backwards to, to move forward in a way that uh, empowers and, and, and takes on these challenges of our day? So having spent four years living in Raleigh, North Carolina, and a push back on your climate claim, August in Atlanta is not ideal. Um, but right. but um, I want to dial in a little more on housing and transportation. I agree it's massive and there's tremendous opportunity and inadequate transportation, inadequate, inadequate housing means that we're educating young people, we're investing all sorts of resources in them. And then they graduate college from UMass and we say, well, you either pay for housing or pay your student loans. So go move to Austin, Texas, right? It's, it's bad form. It's, it's just, it's, we're, we're not doing well by our young people or their families or frankly, our own economy, right? So I'm, I'm right there with you. It is my observation that uh, in, for both for transportation, but certainly for housing, there's this problem where you know, the state says, well, the cities and towns, they control the zoning. They need to do more. And the cities and towns say, well, but if we change our zoning, we don't have the money to build a new fire station or a new school or a new fill in the blank to serve the additional people. And so what is your vision for, as Lieutenant Governor, helping to sort of broker uh, this tension uh, even if everyone agrees we should have more housing and solve the congestion, how do we get there from here? Yeah, I would say I'm not sure everyone agrees. I'm super curious to see what happens with the housing choice legislation and the requirement for multifamily zoning. 
or forfeiting, you know, grant opportunities? Do we need a bigger stick? Is that stick going to be enough? Are to interrupt gonna... you, everyone agrees we need more housing. They don't all agree that they need more housing in their own neighborhood. Well, there you go. There you go. There. So, somewhere we do, but not necessarily here, right? You know, I think there is more that we can take on uh, together. And I think there's a role for the state to play in being a convener around that. I just mentioned to you, Salem Skipper, this rideshare service. Um, the city of Newton has something similar. They started it for their seniors, and I think they're now expanding it to be citywide. But there's no reason that we need to be taking on these challenges one community at a time. Who came up with the idea? Who had the resources to put it into play? Um, I think there's efforts that can be brought, brought to bear from the state being a convener, taking on the technical assistance. I, we talked about Skipper. You know, we also have a car share service. We started with Get Around. We subsidized it by purchasing the cars to make low cost hourly service avail hourly rental of cars available as another way to be car optional in Salem. If you come here, you may not have to own your own car, or if you have two cars, maybe you can go down to one car between a ride share service, a car share service, a bike share service. And then how do we think about land use policy so we don't have food deserts so that you can have the notion of a 15 minute neighborhood where you can walk to get some of your, you know, the staples that you might need growing up. Let's not have each community be doing that unto themselves. That very simple, but very powerful and helpful rideshare service skipper took a feasibility study, took some technical assistance, you know, had us really uh, spending some dollars up front. We got some grant dollars to help with it to develop the system. How many vans? What's it going to look like? What are we going to call it? Like there's a role for the state to play in being a convener, providing some of that technical assistance. Early on, we got some grants from MassDOT to help with some of the startup costs. How do we empower that to happen in more places? If you're a community that's growing where you are, accepting housing or uh, enabling housing to happen in your community, we're going to help you by giving you access to some of these multimodal opportunities to get people around less than a single occupancy vehicle. That's good for housing. That's good for climate change. It's good for residents who were finding out during pandemic actually like getting out, you know, whether it's walking or biking or finding other options. And I think our younger population's used to it. A lot of them, it's a badge of honor not to own a car. Cars are expensive. They cost money. Uh, not just for gas and maintenance, but insurance and excise. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a, in my mind, a campaign that we have here to encourage and then provide technical assistance and maybe help subsidize and fund. If you're growing, we're with you. We're your partner. We're going to provide you some tools and resources to help address some of those needs. And along the way, it's also good for climate change. It's also good for quality of life. As uh, some of my viewers know, my household doesn't own a car. My wife and I and our two kids, we use the T, we bike, we walk, uh, we use Lyft, right? We all kinds of things. Um, my wife seems to be in an airplane at least twice a week lately, um, but, uh, but no car. Uh, it works in my community because uh, we, I live in essentially a 15 minute community, a 15 minute neighborhood. Um, I want to, you, you mentioned uh, schools earlier, and I want to sort of circle back. Uh, my sense is that at the local level, um, you said, you know, I, I know as mayor, you're chair of the school committee, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, you're in it. Um, you're, Up to you're my in neck. It. Up to my and, neck. <laughs> that's right. And um, what have we, what have you, what have we learned about public education during the pandemic and what's the transition look like? What do we keep? Um, what do we do about that uh, with guidance from the state? And like fair warning, you, you got less than five minutes, ready to go. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm gonna talk about schools because I think that's important, but before leaving that question on housing, you're right. The Brooklines in Salem of the world are a little more spoiled because we're dense. I was talking to some Hilltown uh, Chesterfield and Worthington, and some of their issues are about affordable housing and transportation. So even though the characters of our neighborhoods may look different, some of the challenges are the same, and I think there are solutions there as well. Their regional transportation may not be a Salem skipper. It may be investment in the regional transportation network that looks different, or rideshare services that maybe take on a larger function than just what we're doing in our community. So I just want to make that point that no matter where you live, housing and transportation still feel like major you know, bones of contention that we need to address statewide. Getting onto schools, like Salem's a gateway city, very diverse population. I think kids have been some of the biggest victims of this pandemic. Uh, the level of disruption, not just in academic gaps, but that social and emotional. We know like peers learn from peers, adolescents learn from adolescents. And we've seen that, uh, that inability for them to be together and certainly to be together in the way that you normally would 
has got a, a long hangover, a long, much longer hangover than just one school year. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges are the folks who would normally be, you know, really dug in on what are we doing next September when we start school, hopefully in a more, you know, normal setting. These same folks just look like they stormed Normandy, you know, principals, uh, superintendents, educators who are feeling uh, just completely put out by all the work that's been engaged, just keeping kids in school, you know, uh, adhering to COVID protocols, all the challenges that we're seeing around behavior and real needs that kids and staff are sharing and showing. Um, I think going forward, we've got to really convene some of the, the best minds we have in our Commonwealth and not allow every district to do this one, you know, one city or town or school district at a time. We have an opportunity for DESE in the state to be less of an auditor and more of a partner in this work as we think about how to look at the schedule. Um, maybe our schedule needs to change. Uh, for some students, uh, older, older students in, partic in particular, maybe there's a methodology we can use Zoom. Um, there's an opportunity for us to think about with an educator shortage, maybe technology can be our friend, both what's happening in the classroom and, and how we address the needs of students going forward. Um, and, and educators who are also telling us, um, geez, I, could, I had a, an educator in our district who said, I could teach English to students in China and make more money. I could do it virtually. I would never have to leave my house. And I don't do it because I really value the connection with students. I think that's really powerful. Let's put our educators, our, our uh, non-educators, who are folks who are innovators in this field together and see what we can do and not be afraid to pilot some things. We know schools weren't working before the pandemic for many students, for many families. Here's an, our, our opportunity with some resources to rethink how we take on these challenges. Um, here in Salem, we're looking at things like expanding our pre-K. Uh, we know that is key, not just for the, our youngest residents, but also uh, for working families. Uh, literally had a lottery with folks crying who got into the pre-K setting. If the state of Alabama can have every four-year-old in a high quality pre-K setting, why can't we? Well, the answer is we can, and we should, and we have to. So I think there's a lot of work for us to do in schools. Um, as somebody who's on the school committee, um, and sees this every single day, I think there are answers and I'm excited about being able to roll up my sleeves. And again, we're individual school districts. We don't wanna give up the autonomy, but we can't do it alone. And so that convener, that power of bringing together the best ideas and a menu of choices and options and that technical assistance that's so necessary um, to sort of you know, plant those roots in what might be possible. Uh, I, that's the work that I relish and I think we can, we can do better uh, when we bring people together. Mayor, we're, we're almost out of time, but if you would, uh, final thoughts. I guess I would say I'm excited about being Lieutenant Governor or the opportunity to be Lieutenant Governor. I love support. I work in one city. I love the work, um, but I know that there's more we can do across the Commonwealth. I've been fortunate to have support of colleagues and local officials from throughout the state who see the work that's happening locally. Again, no hiding, part of the get stuff done wing of government as critical as to what comes next. Those of us who have been in a job like this are used to operationalizing plans, bringing people together and uh, forming solutions. And that's what I hope to do uh, in this race. That's what we're gonna be talking about. And if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, that is the work that lays ahead. And really appreciate a chance to be with you today and talk about some of these challenges. Um, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is our future and I think we've got more work to do and I'm happy to roll up my sleeves and play a part in that. All right, folks, to your website. My website is kimdriscoll.org, really simple. So if you go to kimdriscoll.org, you can sign up to uh, help out. Uh, you can get more information if you'd like to learn more. You can also reach out directly. My cell phone number is there and uh, look forward to connecting with people. We're hitting every corner of the Commonwealth, so we'll be in Brookline, I'm sure. Well, again, thanks so much for coming on Brookline Interactive Group. Uh, we wish you the best of luck in your campaign and, and don't be a stranger. Thank you.